Okay, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak on this occasion. Um, in my talk, I will be addressing a theme that has repeatedly come up during the conference, namely the impact of big data on the social sphere. I will not be talking so much about cities, but rather about society, um, how this all translates to cities should be clear um, from what I say. Um, I will not address the many opportunities that modern information technologies bring to the social world, but rather also be critical, unfortunately. Um, what I consider the most fundamental challenge, and this challenge results from the rise of a network society that is from a society in which increasingly everything is linked with everything else. Almost certainly in the near future, the internet will expand from a network linking just computers and their users to a network connecting ever more areas of the social and the physical world. In fact, this is already happening. Cell phones, cars, buildings, devices in your home, at work, everything is equipped with sensors, interfaces, radio transmitters, and will thus be integrated into the larger internet. So this internet of people and things, the integration of the physical and the social world into one single network permits on an unprecedented scale uh, the collection of ever larger data sets correlating all parameters of human life. I will argue that this allows maybe for the first time in history to establish a substantial body of causal knowledge in the social sciences. The internet and its extension to the internet of things renders obsolete most of the traditional arguments against causal knowledge in the social sciences, namely the algorithms are much better equipped than human brains to handle the complexity of social phenomena and the internet and the internet of things increasingly allow for systematic and controlled experimentation in the social realm. Now, owing to the very nature of causality, this body of knowledge which is being amassed by machines, in the machines, will allow for an increasing predictability and control over the social sphere. So let me start my argument with an analogy, the analogy between society and another complex and chaotic system, the weather. So what you see in the graph on the left is a depiction of the considerable improvement of weather forecasts over the last decades. The different lines denote forecasts for three, five, seven, and, not, and 10 days, both for the northern hemisphere, the upper lines in the southern hemisphere, the lower lines respectively. Um, essentially, the slope denotes the improvement in weather predictions, so what you see is a slow and gradual change, which nevertheless means that, for example, today, five-day predictions are as good as three-day predictions were 10 years ago. So essentially, there are three different factors, you see them on the right, uh, that have led to this increase in accuracy, more data, increased computing power, and better models. But since the change is happening so slowly for many of us, this quite spectacular improvement has gone largely unnoticed. Now, remarkably, we are facing a, a similar sa situation today with respect to social phenomena. Uh, over the past decades, enormous data sets have been collected mostly by large internet companies, and this data is analyzed by ever more powerful computers employing automated modeling techniques. Quite plausibly then, these data sets allow for an improved ability to make predictions about social phenomena, predictions which are getting better just as imperceptibly as weather predictions are. Google, for example, is engaged in such social forecasting, trying to predict the movement and needs of internet users. On this Google's trends platform, the search history of specific terms can be looked up, like in this case, Internet of Things and how the term correl cor correlates with geography, which you see on the right, or with news items, the letters you see on the left. Uh, and then Google's algorithms also hypothesize about the popularity of search entries in the future, uh, the dotted extension of the line, um, aiming at predictions in the as yet limited social world of the internet. Now here's a simple formula that tells you how to turn the ability to predict into an ability to control. And this formula has been known 
um, speaking in London, speaking in England, this formula has been known at least since the times of Francis Bacon, the intellectual father of the Royal Society and long considered the founding figure of modern scientific method. Bacon famously wrote that human knowledge and human power meet in one and he explicitly refers to causal knowledge for where the cause is not known, the effect cannot be produced. Thus, if the, causes of an are known, uh, if the causes of a phenomenon are known, it becomes predictable. If in addition we can manipulate these causes, then we also have control over the phenomenon. Plausibly, the internet and the internet of things allow for just that, for an increasing ability to intervene from the distance on a large scale on the relevant causal parameters. And then this new kind of control, if used systematically, can drastically reduce our freedom to choose and thereby have the stupefying effects that Richard Sennett has been talking about. So here's an example that such mechanisms have successfully been put to work, that large correlated data sets indeed allow for better prediction and control in the social sphere. Uh, James Sorovicki, a columnist of the New Yorker magazine, recently described how American political campaigns, for example, the 2008 Obama campaign, employ a custom-built, constantly evolving algorithm that incorporates hundreds of variables in order to predict any given voter's allegiance and level of enthusiasm. And he continues that to campaign operatives, it sometimes seemed that the algorithm actually knew what voters thought before the voters themselves did. So this is a long and complex story, of course, um, but there seems to be good reason to believe that on the basis of large data sets, it was possible to identify some causally relevant parameters which subsequently could be man manipulated. Apparently, this allowed for a small uh, but definite degree of control to make people vote or even influence for whom. So if you're interested in the details, just take a look at this recent book by Sasha Isenberg, The Victory Lab, which you see the cover on the left. So here's an obvious objection. How can we be controlled by these alleged laws given human freedom, given that we are ultimately free in our choices? And this apparent contradiction was already noted in the 19th century when for the first time considerable amounts of social data were collected, if still by hand and not yet by machines. And by much of our present day statistical tools were developed. At the same time, there was a virulent debate to what extent human actions are determined by social boundary conditions if the social sphere allows for cause loss just as the natural sciences do. Is it true, for example, as Adolf Catelet, one of the major figures in this debate, claimed that it is society that prepares the crime and a guilty man's crime is just the fruit of the circumstances in which he finds himself? In the 19th century, the debate on how much human behavior is determined by causal laws ended without result, mainly because all candi candidates for such laws turned out much less stable and reliable than originally expected. There just was not enough data, but maybe there is now. To what extent can the enormous data sets of the internet be used for a control of the social sphere? It is not so much an issue if we are free or not, but rather at what instances we are free to choose and to which extent we are free. Free that is determined not by external conditions, but by our own internal conscious deliberations. So let me thus conclude. Um, as imperceptibly as weather forecasts have improved in the recent decades, a new kind of social science has arisen that apparently can only exist in these large data centers as the one of Google, which you see on the right, it may be called a social science in silico in the computers, and it is made possible by the large data sets of the network society, which increasingly link every aspect of human life. This novel science, this novel kind of science, comprises an almost infinite number of dynamically evolving correlations and causal laws. As other sciences, it allows for predictions, for explanations, and for a certain degree of control. But in other respects, the science is unlike any other science that is currently taught in schools or at universities. It is a science that has to stay in its digital cage as it does not fit into the limited 
and static environment of conventional textbooks or even our human brains. So already today, but increasingly so in the future, the science will allow for the control of certain parts of the social world. And it is no exaggeration to state that slowly a new instrument of power has arisen and keeps rising. And this situation requ requires a debate on how this power should be used and who should be allowed to use it. So to make it clear, this is not about privacy. It is not about personalized data. Rather, it is often irrelevant if the data is linked to a specific name or not. So we need this debate on how this social science in silico can be employed for the human good. The status quo seems at least problematic that access so far is restricted to a small number of high-tech companies who largely use it for their economic success. Thank you.